I love those old hymns. There's victory in Jesus. Come on, somebody. That never gets old to sing those. And so what I want to do now, I'm going to segue right into uh, another act of worship, and that is not just with our words, but through our giving. And we are a church that practices biblical generosity. We are committed to it, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And we believe the uh, normal response to the grace of Jesus Christ is generosity. As he opens our hearts, we open up our hands to give to those in need and to bless the works in the kingdom of God. So if you'd like to participate today in our giving and practice biblical generosity, you can do so by following the prompts on the screen here. Also, you can follow the links in the chat provided for you. Simple, safe, easy way to give. You can give through the app. You can give online. You can mail it in. All of that's provided for you there. Safe, secure, and easy for you to give. And let me just say, I am just, I am humbled by your faithfulness, your continued faithfulness in this area. I'm just blown away as we do God's work and we all continue to give. So let me just say, as your pastor, thank you. Well, if you have been around Stone Creek for any length of time, you've probably heard me say this. In fact, I said it in the prayer meeting uh, this past Wednesday is that one, the word one is at the heart of everything that we do. You can't spell Stone Creek without the word one. And in fact, you can, you can see here on this diagram that we are centered on the one. That, that means uh, that's privately and also corporately. And that, that just means that we're centered around the presence of God. That's what it means. It means that we, aren't, we can't build it around a person, a personality, anyone's gifting. It is around the presence of God. We believe the church is at its best when God is leading it with his presence. Then we also have embracing biblical oneness, you can see there. And then we also have pursuing the one by giving and going. And we've taken time in the past to articulate those. But today, we're gonna to hear a wonderful message from our legacy pastor, uh, Pastor Gary Grogan, just talking to us about the importance of the presence of God. And I can think of uh, no better person to talk to this because I've seen him live it. I was on staff with him for over a decade and he is a man who really pursues the presence of God. And I think you're gonna enjoy what you're about to hear. So please welcome with me, Gary Grogan. I want to talk about the presence of God. That's what being Pentecostal is all about. It's about being a person of the present. We love the presence of God. We know how to get into the presence of God. We want to live in the presence of God. There are so many benefits to being a person of the presence. That's what our churches are all about. It takes the presence of God to take the words of our songs, the words of our worship. It takes the presence of God. We call that the anointing to take the preacher's message and cause that to come alive in a person's heart so that they can become a follower of Jesus. This is what it's all about from, from Genesis all the way through Re Revelation. Almost said revolution. Um, it's all about the presence of God. God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. And John in Revelation chapter 22, the presence of God, this living stream flowing out of heaven. Here's the first thing I want to say about the presence of God. The presence of God, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Here's what I believe. Joy is a sign that the Holy Spirit is working in my life. The Holy Spirit is moving in my life. Psalm 1611, the psalmist said, In your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures evermore. This was repeated by the Apostle Peter in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.28. You will make me full of joy in your presence. This is what I know about the Pentecostal church. It is a culture of joy. God wants us to bear the fruit of joy even in difficult times, even in trials, even in temptations. This is what he wants us to do. And this I know about joy. It is a Christian virtue. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, the byproduct of being a person of the presence. This is what it means to walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, or, or Galatians 5, 25, rather. This is what it means to keep in step with the Spirit. The, the first fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, and the second one is joy. It's no accident that in that list of nine fruit of the Spirit, God in His sovereignty lists joy as the second fruit. It is so much more than an emotion. Happiness is dependent upon our circumstances. Joy is dependent upon our relationship. It's dependent upon God's presence. What I've noticed is when the Holy Spirit is moving in my life, there is this fruit of joy regardless of the situations, the circumstances, and the difficulty. This I know about joy. Not only is it a Christian virtue, it's so much higher than simply emotion. I, I would say this, first of all, when temptations and trials come, you know the first flower that the devil cuts off? It's the flower of joy. And Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's another thing I know about joy. Not only is it a Christian virtue, but it is our strength. We cannot serve the Lord. We cannot do Christian ministry without joy. The other thing I know about joy is it keeps our salvation experience real and authentic. Great passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 12, verse number 3. Therefore, with joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. I used to pour concrete with my grandfather, and his specialty was fixing cracked wells. So we'd get all the mud out of the bottom and, and let it dry out. Literally, he would lower fans down in there and let it dry out. And then we would pour concrete. And that old man, we would lower him down. He would get in a bucket, a wooden bucket, and we had a rope tied to that bucket. bucket. And with a windlass, we would let that old man down in that well, and he would smooth out the concrete on the bottom and on the side where there were cracks. Well, the water in the well is our salvation. It is refreshing. It's so wonderful to know the Lord. It's so great to lay your head down on your pillow at night with a clear conscience because you are a child of God. You know, regardless of what takes place, He's in charge of your life. He's in charge of your future. And the bucket is how we make our experience real and authentic. But you got to have the rope. If you just throw the bucket down there, how are you going to get that experience? Some people, their salvation experience, they've lived for the Lord so long, they've lost their joy. Therefore, with joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. In the presence of the Lord, there is joy. I know this about joy. Often it is a sacrifice. Psalms 27, verse 6. It says, My head shall be lifted above my enemies. I will offer the sacrifices of joy. You've got to know how to praise the Lord even when you do not feel like praising the Lord. You've got to know how to read your Bible even when you don't feel like reading your Bible. You've got to know how to enter into the presence of the Lord. The promises of God, are, have, they are made to the remnant of God's people, the beloved of God's people. Uh, there's no stepchildren in this family. We are either children of God or we are not. And as His child, with confidence, we can enter into His presence even if it is a sacrifice. Let me illustrate it this way. That same grandfather, he had an old pump outside of his house, and he always kept a bucket of water by that pump. It worked on a vacuum system. I don't totally understand it. Um, but when it would dry out, you would have to pour the water down uh, the pump, and it was called priming the pump. And that's why we praise the Lord. That's why even in your own home, wherever it is, once in a while, you've just got to lift your hands. You've got to praise the Lord. 
You, you got to pray out loud. You got to uh, use your prayer language and express yourself to the Lord. Make a sacrifice of joy even when you don't feel like it. Life has a way of robbing us of our joy. Where you serve and where I serve, the difficulties, especially in these days, it is possible to lose our joy. And the trouble when we lose our joy, we want to quit. And this is why we have to be in that place of intimacy, that place of prayer, because prayer brings the presence of the Lord individually and corporately. So in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. I could just talk about this for a long time. But the second thing I want to talk to you about today is that the presence of the Lord gives us rest and peace. I heard someone say one time, rest and you will get God's best. Wow, I really believe that. The patriarch Moses, he understood that leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and through the desert and into the promised land was not all up to him. The Lord says to Moses in Exodus 33, 14, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. And Moses says in verse 14 of Exodus 33, If your presence does not go with us, if your presence does not go with me, do not bring us up from here. They were encamped at Sinai at that time. So I would say to us today, I would say to you today, when things are difficult, when things are going bad, if you can somehow get into the presence of God, tap into the presence of God personally, there will be a supernatural rest and a supernatural peace even in the midst of your storm. That's why Jesus was able to sleep in the boat, because he tapped into the Father's presence. And while the storm was all around him, he was sleeping. He was living in the presence of the Father. And again, this is why we must pray individually and corporately, because prayer is what brings God's presence, and God's presence is what brings joy, and God's presence is what brings rest and peace. One more thing about the presence of God. And I really want you to listen carefully. The presence of God at times does bring disturbance. But it is always for the purpose of progress. When the Holy Spirit is working in your life, and you're hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, go here, speak to that person, do this, fast, spend extra time in prayer, give something extra. When the Holy Spirit is really working in your life and leading you and guiding you and speaking to you, it will at times bring disturbance to your life. God's presence can be an annoyance and a disruption to the normal routines of life. There are so many examples of this. One is in Numbers chapter 9, where it says, when it, wherever the children of Israel were camped in the daytime, there was a pillar of cloud by day, uh, supernatural air conditioning, and at night there was a pillar of cloud of fire supernatural light. Well, just from uh, Numbers chapter 9, verses 15 through the end of the chapter, or just 15 through 19, just four verses, six times it says, whenever the cloud lifted or the pillar of fire lifted, they followed the cloud. Think about this for just a moment. Well, you we're talking about how when you're really spirit-led, you're really spirit-filled. Some people say, well, I got Jesus. Well, my question is, Jesus got you? Some people say, well, I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> my question is, Holy Ghost got you. I got a Bible. 
My question is, Bible got you? It's not about the Lord being on our team. It's about us being on the Lord's team. It's not about our will being done. It's about His will being done. And what I've noticed about true Spirit-filled living, anything I've ever done for the Lord, just about anything, in the very beginning, it brought disturbance and disruption to my life, to my plans, to the way I thought my life was going to go. Oh, I could tell so many stories. But think about this passage in Numbers chapter 9. Six times in a few verses, it says, Every time the pillar of cloud moved, the pillar of fire moved, that Israel broke camp and had to leave. Well, in that desert, they would nap, they would rest in the afternoon because it would be so hot. 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit in the Sinai Peninsula. What if the cloud moved while they were napping? The old people and the children were napping, the babies were napping. They had to pack everything up, everybody had to wake up, and they had to journey because in the cloud was the presence of God, the provision of God, and the protection of God. Are you getting this? Woo. Let's be people of the presence. Let, let's, I, I've been joking with people. I cleaned out my office and uh, I, I, I said to people, wow, I found Jesus in there. <laughs> uh, and a lot of you have been cleaning out closets and dresser drawers and garages and all that stuff. And uh, honestly, I've been sitting in my chair, swinging around, looking at the couch, and I've been experiencing the presence of Jesus in a new way in my office, at home. It's really the truth. What if that pillar of cloud, that pillar of fire moved in the middle of the night? What if it moved at supper time when they were eating uh, manna and uh, quail kebab and drinking water out of a rock? It always brought disturbance, but always for the purpose of progress. His presence moves us from point A to point B, and God's will is over here. God's will is never a straight line. It always goes up and down and over and in between. My, my son, who is a pastor in California, he was with me in the Midwest, and then he got recruited to go to California to church. Then he got recruited to go all the way to North Carolina to to be at another church, and then he got called all the way back to California and San Diego, and he's in his sweet spot. God is really using him and flowing through him, and, but it wasn't a straight line. He didn't leave from where I live in, in uh, the Midwest to the West Coast and stay there. He had to go all the way to the East Coast and all the way back. That's the way it is. Now, I would say this. When we are not right in our relationship with the Lord, there's secret sin like Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.8, we run from the presence of the Lord. So many things about the presence of the Lord. There's healing in the presence of the Lord, spiritual healing, emotional, relational, physical healing. In Luke chapter 5, we read about the power and the presence of the Lord. It was in this place so strong that people were being healed. In fact, they some friends of a paralyzed guy removed a roof and they lowered their friend down in, the, in front of Jesus, and he was heal, healed. The key to all this is that you and I must respond to the presence of the Lord. Let me say it again. We are people of the presence. That's what being Pentecostal is all about. That's the only reason our churches are special. It's not our buildings. It's not even preaching, and I like good preaching. It's not our worship, and I like good worship. And, and all of that, but... It's what makes all of that special. It makes our worship special, our preaching and teaching special. Is His presence, Spirit-filled preaching and worship. It's an expectation that we will encounter God's presence. We had this little uh, girl from Mexico who was an intern at our church, and in those days our choir was set in a V like this on our platform. And we had a man come to our church who had never been to church. He was a a professional musician, and he had never seen anybody worship God before. He had four recording studios. He was a personal friend to Stevie Wonder. He had a number one hit called How About Us. 
And he came to church and he saw this little Mexican girl. She was right in the middle and she was worshiping God, experiencing his presence. And he said to himself, I don't know what that is, but I want it. And he ended up giving his life to Jesus. He read the Bible through two and a half times, three and a half times before he got saved. He was easily filled with the Spirit. He ended up becoming one of our elders, our music minister on staff. Was it because of my preaching? Was it because of our building? Was it because of, of all of our technology? I'm not against any of those things. Was it because of the way I was dressed? No, it was because of the presence of God that he experienced, that he saw upon a young lady's life. I need to wrap this up. Let me just say this. This is really big stuff. The truth is, if we do not serve the Lord with joy, Moses told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 28, 47 and 48, the Lord speaks through Moses and says to the Hebrew people, if you do not serve me with joy, then you will serve my enemies. Our enemies today are not the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Amalekites, the Philistines. No, no, no. Our enemies today are depression and despondency and withdrawal and emotional repression and emotional inhibition and anxiety and all that plethora of toxic emotions that hold us back from being whom God's called us to be. Could I encourage you to press in to God's presence. If we will live in the Lord's presence, that's when we see His creative power at work and manifested in our lives. It's what happened to Israel, and it'll what hap it is what will happen to us. One more verse, Psalms chapter 2, verse number 6. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. I want you to follow me now. This says as long as Jesus is on his throne, Satan is powerless against us. And of course, you know in the new covenant where the throne is. It's in your heart. And so my question is, is Jesus really, truly on the throne of your heart? Lord, thank you for the word today. Lord, we want to be people of your presence. We want to know how to enter into your presence personally and corporately. It is our strength. It is our joy. It is a virtue. We, we, we cannot even serve you without joy, Lord. We're powerless without joy. Help us to be people of your presence, even when it brings disturbance in our life. Encourage your people today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Love you.